Welcome, everyone. This is Colin Clark, Senior Vice President, Retirement Plans here at Washington Financial Group Hub International. And we want to just welcome everyone to the latest edition of the Washington Financial Group Fiduciary Fitness Podcast Series. And I'm pleased to be joined today by Jewel Esposito, uh, who is a partner at Fisher Broyles, which is a nationwide uh, law firm. And, and Jewel is a partner in the local Washington, D.C. office. And she primarily works on defined contribution, ERISA plans, on deferred compensation, uh, non-qualified plans, and also on employee benefit plans. And we wanted to talk today uh, just simply, uh, you know, what are some of the things that plan sponsors are dealing with that, that Jewel sees? on her end that are kind of causing problems or can get, you know, plan sponsors into trouble uh, from a compliance standpoint. So welcome, Jewel. Thanks for being here. Nice to be here, Colin. Thank you. Yeah. So if you could just list out a few things that you see out there right now that that plan sponsors are dealing with, and then we'll kind of unpack that a little bit and and get under the hood on a couple of these issues. Sure. I think um, for this type of podcast, it's easy to focus on the very obvious things that I see are problems with 401k plans. The first big problem is a problem that the IRS and the DOL both target, and that is the employer's late transmission of employee money into the 401k plan, basically called late employee deferrals. And a second problem I see often is that employers don't know how to evaluate or respond to the annual testing results that a third party administrator, TPA, prepares for the employer. And the third and fourth are not knowing um, how much to get for an ERISA bond or getting a fiduciary insurance. And then the final one would be that employers don't really know how to explore and exploit all the possible tax and compensation benefits that a 401k plan or other retirement plan might give the employer first and then its employees. So I'm ready to go when you are. Yeah, yeah. So let's just let's let's start with the late deferrals because we see that quite often, especially when we are onboarding a new client or working with current clients that maybe there someone has come in that's new to the plan. What are the standards and what should be applied as a standard? One standard is already out there in Department of Labor guidance, and the Department of Labor uses what is called the seven business day safe harbor rule, and any employer who has fewer than 100 participants gets a safe harbor latitude of processing employee payrolls. So when payroll is paid and an employee gets a paycheck, the employer has seven business days, which you know translates to a week and a half to get that employee money into the plan. But if the employer with fewer than 100 participants doesn't want to use that safe harbor rule, then really what that employer has to demonstrate is that it takes X number of days to get employee money into the plan. And if it's longer than seven days, again, that's seven business days. So if it's closer to two weeks of getting money from the employee paycheck to the plan, the employer has to demonstrate why it takes two weeks to do that. And if there's a good reason, then it's fine. But if the IRS or Department of Labor comes in and sees that, yes, it takes two weeks for money to get to the plan, but in late summer, the employer can put that money in within three days. And basically, we all know it's because that person who processes payroll is on a two-week summer vacation. And so they quickly get that money into the plan. That tells the IRS and the Department of Labor that, well, does it really take you two weeks to get the money into the plan when an employee can get it in within three days? So it's it's really dependent upon what the practices are with the employer and why the money has to be late. There is a rule that people often misread and employers seem to think that they can deposit the money on the 15th business day of the following month, yeah. which almost makes it appear if you're paying, for example, a payroll on February 2nd, some employers think they have till March 15th to put the money in from the February 2nd payroll. And the Department of Labor unequivocally says you cannot read the rule like that, despite the way it seems written. Use the safe harbor if you are fewer than 100 participants. If you're over 100 participants or can't comply with that safe harbor, then find out what your procedures are to really move money as quickly as possible into the the 401k trust. 
and then stick with that. Well, do you think a good standard is, is essentially, you know, with, with most, most technology with payroll companies, you're, you're enable you to upload uh, your, your, your FICO taxes and things like that. Is that, do you think that is a fair standard or a good way that plan sponsors should go about transmitting contributions? The answer is yes. So okay. if electronically and ACH wise, wire wise, the employer is able to pay state taxes, federal taxes, FICA, FUTA, SUDA in so many days, then the analysis from the government will be if you can pay all them, then you can pay into the employee trust basically in the same quick time frame. The problem is not employers have the most well-known nationally prominent payroll companies. They might have a smaller payroll company. That's their choice. And perhaps they don't do everything as quickly as some of the more established ones. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, that's your payroll system. Those are your procedures. Those are your timelines. But when that payroll company is paying all these other entities, then it has to be viewed that likely they could pay the 401k trust at the same time. So thanks for that explanation, Jewel. Uh, So moving on to the second question, which essentially, or the second point, uh, not reading testing results from the TPA. I assume you're talking about things like the ADP and ACP tests that plan sponsors have to do every year. Can you kind of unpack that for us and explain what those acronyms are? When a plan operates, it has to make sure that it isn't operating so much in favor of upper management or those who are highly paid. That's it in in plain English. So there are different tests that employers have to run when they have a 401k plan. And one of those tests is the average deferral percentage test, ADP, and average contribution percentage test, ACP. And the way those tests run are this. For the ADP, average deferral test, it's this. Let's say I'm an employee, I make $50,000, and 5,000 of my pay goes into the 401k trust. When you look at me, I'm contributing 10% of my pay. And the test then looks at every employee that's making a contribution to the plan, and they look at the numerator of what they're contributing over the denominator, which is their own personal compensation. And what the test does is it looks at how are the lower paid people contributing? Are they contributing a a high percentage of their paycheck into the plan? How are the higher paid employees contributing? And basically, if the higher paid employees are contributing so much of their paycheck, let's just make up a number of like 30% of their paycheck. But the, the lower paids, when all the testing is done, show that they're only contributing 1% of their paycheck when averaged across all of the lower paid. That ADP test forces the employer to say, no, you highly paid cannot put in that much money. We have to give money back to you so that the percentage gets a little closer to what the lower paid have put into the plan. With the ACP, average contribution percentage test, it's very much similar in the fraction analysis. And it's basically what are the employer contributions put in on each employee's behalf, like profit sharing or match or other employer contributions that go into the plan. And again, it's looked at employee by employee based on how much of an employer match or profit share they get. And that's the numerator over the denominator of the personal compensation. And again, the test makes an employer look to see if all of the profit sharing is going to the higher paids, for example, or if so much of the profit sharing is going to um, the higher paids or the match is going to them. If that's the case, again, the test requires that the employer either give more to the lower paids or take money out of the accounts of the higher paid such that they don't get so matched or they don't get so much of the profit sharing. There are other tests, and this is where I think there are failures on the employer's part. There's a top-heavy test to make sure that when you look at all the plan assets in the 401k, that so much are not held in for just a select handful of employees. They don't want that all the assets are basically sitting in the accounts of three people, but very little money sitting in the rest of the lower paid people. And then aside from that, in those annual discrimination tests, they have other limits that are explored. For example, 
an individual can't contribute more than I think this year it's might might be nineteen thousand dollars for employee money. It changes every year. That's mm-hmm. why I don't know it. You might know it off the bat. Yeah, nineteen five. Okay, nineteen thousand five hundred. So someone has to look to see that a person doesn't contribute more than that. Someone has to look that they're eligible to put in catch up if they're putting extra money in. Or is a 30-year-old putting in catch-up where a 30-year-old is not allowed to? So there are all these other limits that have to be examined. Are they ensuring that all the people who are age 21 are allowed to be in the plan if that's how the plan is designed? So someone has to be looking at those aspects of the plan, and usually that's done in this annual testing or review of the plan. The problem I see with clients is they get those packages back from the third party administrator, their TPA, and they don't know how to analyze the results. And that's why I think there's a disconnect. Someone has to step in and help the employer understand if they've passed the test, great. If they failed it, it doesn't mean they get a big fat F. It just means then what they, what should they do because they failed it? Can they make tweaks in their operations right now so that you don't have this mistake continuing for several years in a row. Yeah, and it never feels good to fail, but I know as a as a consulting that is an advisory firm, I know we're always working with clients to improve their plan design and maybe implement something like a safe harbor design or use like an auto enroll auto escalate feature. Uh, to help solve for some of those things. And so I totally agree. Your administrator is going to be sending you those tests and you definitely want to share them with your advisor and consultant so they can work with you to try to find the best fit for your organization because every organization is different. Right. So I, I agree with that fully. So when a company fails, it is not that devastating. It it's a chance to look at the plan and say, why are we failing? Is it because it isn't designed right? And as you said, go seek help on designing in such a way that maybe incentivize employees to participate or do that safe harbor match, which you know could be a 3% or a 4% match so that everyone can put money in and everyone could maximize what they're allowed to do if those are the types of failures you're seeing. So the failures will give an indication of how the plan could be designed better such that there won't be future failures. But to me, Having a failure is not devastating in itself. It just means for the employer to examine the whole design and figure out why it's happening. And if you can design around this so that it doesn't happen in successive years. Agreed. So the third topic, you'd mentioned that you're you're still seeing that plan sponsors are not covering their plan uh, with ERISA bonds or fiduciary insurance. And they they get mixed up sometimes. Can you kind of share with us the difference in, in what you're seeing? Sure. So I am making a distinction with the ERISA required fidelity bond, or people call it the ERISA bond, versus ERISA fiduciary insurance. So the first one, which is required under Department of Labor rules, is the ERISA required bond. And what the Department of Labor rules say is that the employer must have a bond equal to 10% of the assets in the plan as of January 1st or the first day of the plan's plan year. Calendar year plan, January 1st would be that first day. 10% of the assets have to be covered. And what that is, is if anything happens to the assets due to dishonesty or theft, then there's a bond that will replenish those assets. And basically then the participants are protected because if the money in the plan disappears, then the, the, the plan is essentially backfilled by way of the bond. And those bonds are actually very inexpensive and they can do an auto escalate to ensure that they are as large as they need to be as the plan assets grow in size. And then for employers that never had the bond, they can do retroactive coverage and you just have to find the right carriers who will sell this, but the bonds are inexpensive. What I see M&A deals is that on the 5,500, an employer has to indicate if they've had this bond. So the employer is telling the Department of Labor whether or not it has a bond that is of the appropriate coverage. And so we can see on an M&A due diligence whether or not the employer has carried that bond and at what size. And to me, that's giving notice to the Department of Labor that you have fiduciaries that don't know how much of a bond they really need. And so that's an indication too, are they really watching over their plan properly if they can't even get the right size bond? Now, 
that ERISA fidelity bond is to be distinguished from ERISA fiduciary insurance. And so what that is, fiduciaries can and do get sued by plan participants and others. Now, when there's an officer acting as a fiduciary for a 401k plan. Usually that company's insurance coverage will cover that fiduciary with its actions, unless they're egregious or criminal. And therefore that fiduciary is covered. And at a minimum, a company should consider providing that to its fiduciaries as almost a perk. You know, please oversee our plan. And as a perk, we're going to give you insurance coverage to back any decisions you make. I think that should just be a normal perk to give to a fiduciary plan. Separate and apart from that, the fiduciary can be sued, unfortunately, in that fiduciary's personal and individual capacity, which means while the fiduciary can be sued as an HR director at a company and that HR director oversees the 401k plan, the plan participants and their attorneys could sue that HR director in his or her individual capacity named not as the HR director of the company, but as Jane Doe, John Doe in his or her individual capacity. And so perhaps that individual wants to get fiduciary coverage so that that person's personal assets, house, car, savings, and a bank aren't personally attached. Well, in in speaking to that too, and I, I hear you because, you know, being that we are Hub International Mid-Atlantic, we have a whole department dedicated to this. And uh, it is really important to make sure, and we run into plan sponsors all the time. Uh, and with anything in the commercial lines insurance business, the devil's in the details. So while the ERISA bond, you're absolutely correct, is pretty sta- straightforward. It's very inexpensive. Fiduciary insurance doesn't have to be super expensive, and it's usually bundled with your other commercial lines as well, but it's really important with any insurance policy to look at the exclusions. And so we always consult uh, clients to really take a hard look at what package they have and and to make sure that they have the proper limits and the proper coverage, because you just never know what's going to happen. So I I completely uh, agree with you on that. And Colin, I have been involved in transactions where the employer has had to pull out all the, those fiduciary coverages, the fidelity bonds, et cetera, et cetera. And it's only under the threat of litigation when they realize how much is actually not covered. And oftentimes I see that the party to be covered or thought they were covered is not covered because the fidelity bonds insured is the plan, not the employer. Yeah. Not an individual, it's the plan. The money goes to the plan. In the fiduciary insurance side of things, you want the fiduciary or the employer, if it's acting in that capacity, to be covered. You're not covering the plan with certain insurance. So you're right, the devil is in the details and someone should really figure out if the right parties, the plan, the employer, the the individual, the HR director as an HR director, the HR director as an individual is properly covered. Well, what I hear you saying is a, a great takeaway from today's podcast is for you to take a, just have a review, you know, just have an independent review of your insurance packages and, and then just, you know, match them up with, with the way your plan's operating and uh, make sure that you're properly covered. Mm-hmm. I, it is very much like getting insurance for your house. You think you've got everything covered until you have a leak in your ceiling. Something happens, yeah. And then you go to read your policy and you, and you realize, oh, that's not covered. But here with the ERISA fidelity bond dictated by law, ERISA, you know what has to be covered. So you have to go get that coverage. And now with the fiduciary insurance, which is optional, go get that and figure out if you're covered for litigation, claims, audits, et cetera. Yeah, that's incredibly helpful. So, so moving on to the fourth topic, this one's uh, interesting because I see this a lot as well. Sometimes people think, hey, I have to have a retirement plan and I check the box because I have to have benefits as I'm either setting up my company for the first time or maybe I've been in business for a little while. But really, you know, there is a lot of a misunderstanding around in, in terms of what all the benefits of a you know, defined contribution plan are. And so can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes. So the benefits for a 401k plan and other retirement plans are several. First, as you know, an employee can put money into the plan. And if the employee puts money into the plan, then that amount is not income taxed. So it's income tax free, at least today, of employee money. And then that money can grow and the growth in that money will not be taxed currently. And then if the employee terminates, 
when the employee pulls that money out of the plan, it can be rolled over tax-free, meaning no income tax yet, into that plan with no tax consequences at that point. And then the employer gets deductions for all contributions to the plan. And in addition, it's not the trust is not taxed on that growth. But that's like the tax side of things. We all know that employee perks help with recruiting, hiring, and retention of employees. So I'm very much in favor of employee benefit plans used for that purpose, recruiting, hiring, and retention. So that's very good and something to consider. But oftentimes I hear from companies that having employee benefit plans is expensive. And I just want to tick off really quickly that For those employers who don't have a 401k plan, for example, aside from all the benefits that I just articulated about deferral of taxation, deferral of the growth in the plan, there is a new employer who starts a 401k plan, has the benefit each year for three years under the SECURE Act that allows uh, what could effectively be 5500 in tax credit, not a deduction, tax credit, meaning take lop it off the liability of the company, tax liability of the company, 5500 each year for three years. So right there, you have the ability to spend, quote unquote, freely 16500 to start a plan that gives you all the perks that I just went through. So I think employers lose sight of that much of the startup costs and perhaps even the current administration of a plan could essentially be free because of the tax credits given to it. No, that's a great point. And and I think the federal government did a good job with the SECURE Act in, in trying to expand how many small businesses can afford to get that tax advantage plan up and running. And, and really, the, the ta- depending on how you structure the plan, the tax advantages for, for a small business owner can be tremendous. And obviously, that, for a corporation, right. for a corporation, you're getting the recruitment and the retention standpoint. And, and, and to take it one step further, what we're seeing is in this idea of financial wellness, uh, we have data that shows that uh, companies that set up in, in uh, you know, excellent uh, benefit packages, especially on the 401k side uh, or the 403b side, uh, they find that their employees are happier and more productive. Well, I would agree with that. Um, and we have been talking about 401ks, but 403b say, certainly serve the same purpose. I think they feel rewarded. I feel like they feel like they're saving money. Um, they're, they're grateful for the employer setting up the vehicle that allows it. And, you know, there are about 10 states now that are mandating that employers have retirement plans. And if they don't, then they must go into a forced auto IRA situation. It's different um, between and among those 10 or so states. But rather than having an employer get um, railroaded into an auto IRA situation, why not go ahead and set up? Um, their own individual plan, again, with the tax credits that are available to them. So there's, there's an opportunity. And then what you said is true. Um, you can have a plain vanilla 401k safe harbor plan and employees will be happy. Um, I see. I see that that's what happens. And then you can take design the plan in such a way that if there is a very big profit sharing contribution, I'll just say maybe half a million dollars, just making up an amount. Depending upon how the plan is designed, the profit sharing allocation can legitimately favor certain people, say management or shareholders, you know, the owners of the company in the way it's designed. It has to be designed properly, but, um, just using that example of 500,000, yep. let's say a company did well and they have 500,000 to share. They don't want to give it to the, the employees in cash bonuses. They want to put it into the plan. So 500,000 is going to go to all the employees no matter what. But now it's a question, how much goes to Jane? How much goes to John? How much goes to Tim? Et cetera, et cetera. How much goes to the rank and file? How, how much goes to management? How much goes to the owners? And essentially, depending upon how the formula works in there, and again, it's legal and appropriate under the Internal Revenue Code and under Department of Labor rules, is of the 500,000, you could easily have um, several hundred thousand go to management and the owners 
and then you you spread the balance uh, across the lower paid again it's all legal but you need someone to help design that and that's why I say that there are companies who don't explore and exploit all that they can do with a plan to design it in a way that makes management or shareholders or employees happy. Now that's a great point too. And there, and like I said, with all the data we're seeing, there there is definitely an ROI. And I think again, part of the future of the retirement plan benefit side of things is going to be companies saying, "Are my dollars better invested in the retirement plan to improve the company culture and to improve the bottom line, or are they better?" put somewhere else in the benefit side of things. And I think more and more as we look, you know, if we look at things from a data set, set standpoint, we're seeing that the ROI really, there's a lot of return on investment that, that exists within the retirement plan, not just from a tax benefit, but from, you know, uh, in, from a fiduciary aspect, we're always acting in the best interest of participants. And so really to get our participants in a really good place, uh, financially, so they can retire with dignity, is is the ultimate goal. No, no that that's great, and I, I that is the goal. As an ERISA attorney, I'm always just making sure that the plan uh, conforms to all IRS and Department of Labor rules. But certainly, I get it from an advisor standpoint, your standpoint, that you 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 want to help the employees maximize what they can put into retirement, and so that's great. And then the role I play is. And I want to make sure it's all done right under all the federal laws. That's, and we create a win-win. So, uh, Jewel, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. And uh, we thank you and we look forward to having you back. And uh, with that, we'll uh, uh, everyone have a a great day and and we'll see you next time on the uh, WFG Fiduciary Fitness Podcast. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy our show, We'd love for you to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you access your podcasts. The opinions voiced in this program are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA and SIPC. Investment advice offered through Global Retirement Partners, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Global Retirement Partners, Washington Financial Group, a division of Hub International Mid-Atlantic and Hub International are not affiliated with LPL Financial. Global Retirement Partners, LPL Financial, Washington Financial Group, and Hub International are not affiliated in any way with the services offered by Jewel Esposito and Fisher Broyles. 